this is yet another episode and reason and example of why I love being a podcast host. Elise Bowie is a divorce lawyer, and she didn't start out as a divorce lawyer. It wasn't until after she went through a divorce that she became a divorce lawyer. Such a fascinating, interesting episode about navigating divorce. And a lot of very interesting insight about children, including adult children, and how divorce impacts adult children. And I, being a divorced woman who had uh, adult children when I divorced, it was really, uh, I wished I had Elise in my life when I went through that process. So I think this is a really helpful episode for anybody who is struggling in a marriage, thinking about divorce, or knows somebody who is. So if you have a friend who has mentioned to you that she's unhappy in her marriage and is contemplating divorce, has had discussions about divorce, uh, then please, please let her hear this episode. I think it's going to be really valuable. Uh, and I know a lot of women who get to midlife and want more and their husband or partner isn't on board with that it, it it can be very stifling to your life and i don't want you to have a stifled life i don't want you to be held back by a husband who is wanting to live a smaller life and so you just have to be bold and feel like you need to start these conversations and i'm not saying divorce is the answer i'm just saying you need to have conversations about what you want and you need to know that what you want is just as important. And you will never get what you want if you allow somebody to hold you back. And so it might end in divorce and it's okay. You will live, you will survive. <laughs> divorce is not the end. In fact, divorce is the beginning uh, of a new magical life. Uh, and, and if you don't get divorced, Heck, it'll help your marriage. It'll make your marriage better than it ever has been. But you need to have these conversations. You need to start exploring what you really want. And if you're not being allowed to explore, you're being afraid to explore, you're thinking about it, but not executing on it. Well, first of all, start by listening to this episode and then start making some concrete steps and having some conversations. So without further ado, here is the episode and interview with Elise. Welcome to another episode of Living Your Spark's Second Half. And my guest today is Elise Bowie. She's got a great name. I love your name, Elise. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Lori. That's so funny. It's a name with way too many vowels. So there's got, you know, there's <laughs> all kinds of pronunciation, you know, minefields. It people. should be a wheel of fortune. You know, I mean, it, it should be real. in a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, people will come up with Elsie Bougie. That was the best one that I ever heard. I'm like, where did we get the J in the end? Like, I don't know where that came from, but whenever I want to be confusing to somebody, I'm like, yep, it's Elsie Bougie here. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So I met you actually, I saw a post on Facebook because we share a friend in common, a lawyer. He was my trademark lawyer and, uh, and you you were clearly good friends with him. And I just, you, I looked at, I think I searched on you and I was like, oh my gosh, she's a divorce lawyer. She would have such an interesting story to share. You know, I was been, I went through a divorce at age 47, 48 after 25 years of marriage and uh, without really knowing what, what was ahead. It was very right. scary, scary time. And so I thought, I think there's probably a lot of people out there who are sitting on a bad marriage oh, and yeah. they're not doing anything about it. And I'm not saying divorce is the answer, but they're just not, they're just like status quo. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I would love to have a conversation with you about your experience, your wisdom. You went through a divorce. I did. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, and um, lucky for our listeners, I don't know exactly what age I was when I went through it, because as we just went through, I'm not great with my age, but I think I'm 55. So I think I divorced when I was about 43 or 44. So kind of similar to you, you know, that age I'd been married, I think 18 years at the time. So a little, you know, less um, than you, but you know, still a pretty long solid, time long yeah. marriage, you know, you got over um, the seven year itch. Cause isn't right, there that exactly. <laughs> 
and we had four children and you know they were pretty stair step i think we had four kids in six years so you know there was a lot of children involved and we then also had the complication of hurricane katrina mm. so it was a interesting thing because in Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans in 2005. And about three weeks before the hurricane hit is when we decided we needed to divorce. Oh so my gosh, two hurricanes at once. I mean, seriously, <laughs> there we are, you know, like, okay, yeah, we probably need a divorce. This is, you know, I need to go back to work, you know, because at the time I was staying home with those four kids. I wasn't practicing law. I was, you know, I had been home for a few years with them. And then the hurricane hit. And so we evacuated to Georgia and we were like, yeah, so maybe we're not getting a divorce right now. Like, you know, we need to put our kids first here. Like this is a massive upheaval. So we evacuated to Georgia initially for a year. My ex-husband oh was a, he is an attorney and he got licensed in Georgia. And at the time, very initially, we thought we might stay in Georgia. You know, um, I mean, a few uh, a few months in rural Georgia. And I was like, oh, this is probably not the place for us. Like, and especially if we're going to divorce, because I realized like I really was going to need to get back to work. And, you know, I was going to need to earn good to be able to put all these kids through school and um, and then college, obviously. So we then moved to Minnesota and we relocated to Minnesota. And so at that point, I got licensed in Minnesota. I started a practice in Minnesota and we kind of could made a decision there in Minnesota after a couple of years, we were like, okay, we're stable enough. The kids are stable enough. Like we can actually get our divorce now. And um, so, you know, you would think that would have been kind of the end of it. Well, then I go and get remarried to my amazing husband now but he was in Seattle. So I was in Minnesota. He was in Seattle. Long story. We knew each other from a, more than a decade before our families knew each other. Um, he had gotten a divorce. I, you know, get, gotten a divorce. So we find each other. I then moved to Seattle with all four kids. We blend a family. He has two, I have four. So we now have six. And then, um, so then I have to get relicensed again in Washington and start off. Oh my again. gosh. So, you know, three bar exams later, you know, <laughs> I'm now licensed in, you know, Louisiana, Minnesota, and Washington and have started a law firm in both Minnesota and Washington. And then my ex-husband several years later ended up moving out here as well. So now we all live out here in Washington and both of our ex-spouses are out here in Washington, which is super convenient for all the kids. You know, the kids are now yes. all 20-something-year-olds. They're all over the, the country. We have three here in the Seattle-ish area. And then we have three around the country, one in D.C., one in New York, and one in Japan. And so it, I mean, it's been a fascinating journey. And no one could have ever told me that my ex and I would get along like we do now when we were divorcing, because when we were divorcing, it was mighty ugly. And um, there was some- Well, I, I'm curious about the whole time period between when you first had that discussion before Hur Hurricane yeah. Katrina uh, hit, and then there was, it sounded from how you were describing it, almost like a three-year period where you moved to Georgia and then you moved to Minnesota. And yeah. how was that? Were you just kind of living as roommates, knowing kind of. what was coming? And so you kind of lived your own lives, but we're still under one roof. I mean, we were definitely still under one roof and, you know, but we, we knew what was coming for sure. And, but we also were in no position to divorce at the time. I mean, fiscally, you know, we both were lawyers licensed in Louisiana and, you know, a lawyer doesn't just get to go start in another state. And so, you know, you've got to retake a bar exam. And often that's a nine month process to even qualify to sit for the exam, like to go through all the bar regulations and all the application process. And then you actually have to sit for the exam and wait for your results. So, I mean, it can be up to a year to get the results. And I mean, that's a longer conversation around Hurricane Katrina and what happened to so many displaced attorneys mm. who, because Louisiana's got no reciprocity with any state. And so instead of the Louisiana Supreme Court opening up reciprocity 
for lawyers to then let lawyers come into Louisiana and practice, they were very protective and they didn't want, especially Mississippi lawyers coming in to take all that Katrina litigation. So that left all these Louisiana lawyers in a real pickle. And so it was a, I mean, it was to say it was a difficult time is an understatement. I mean, it was an exceedingly difficult time to live in a relationship that, you know, was not only over, but I mean, was, you know, really negative in many ways. And obviously if I could, you know, wave a magic wand and make it all be different. I mean, that is not what I would have wanted for myself, my ex or my family, you know, and, but at the time we were doing, I think what we both thought was the best we could do with the circumstances that we were faced with and, you know, doing our best to keep our kids front and center and just make sure we could both get relicensed so that we both could do the work we were going to need to do to be able to fiscally support these kids moving forward. Yeah. And, and you once you get your bar, it doesn't mean you have a full list of clients. So well, you no. got to build that clientele and then you're moving. And so... That has got to be difficult. So I'm curious because before we I hit record, I asked you if you practiced divorce law before you got divorced and you said no, you yeah. practice. And I know there's a myriad of different types of law. So did getting and going through the divorce lead you to want to help other people navigate that tough time? Absolutely. I mean, when I started really investigating divorce, you know, I mean, like really deep into it was in Minnesota, like figuring out, okay, how are we going to actually do this? You know, what is this going to look like? What is spousal maintenance going to look like? You know, what is all the things? And so I became super interested in co-parenting and how do you co-parent successfully? And what does this look like for children? Because like you said, at the time there, we were living, you know, under the same roof and, in essence, having to co-parent, I mean, minus the big love between us. Do you know what I mean? Like there mm -hmm. was a lot of just anger and built up resentment and just all kinds of problems, bad communication, you know, all kinds of things. And so learning to navigate co-parenting while we lived under the same roof was really very helpful. But it also made me realize there is a lot to know. And people often go to a divorce attorney and I mean, they're just putting them through the paces of like, okay, get us your financial documents. We're going to get a parenting plan. Nobody is sitting down and really talking about like child development and how a parenting plan for a four-year-old is going to be great for a four-year-old. And it's going to be horrible for a teenager because a, a four-year-old needs, you know, regular contact with both parents. They've got, you know, some of that attachment kind of issues and they need that regular contact. Whereas a teenager needs a longer time with each parent to settle in and, you know, get to their groove. So they might need a, a week on, week off kind of schedule. And so I became, I mean, if I may say so, like a real expert on co-parenting, you know, like went to thousands of hours of training, you know, on just co-parenting, how to do it, child development, dispute resolution, you know, all the things. So when it came time to, for me to go back to work, it was just a natural thing for me to start a family law firm because I was like, I mean, this is, I mean, the whole time I'm doing it for myself and I'm learning all the things. And I was like, well, why not just put all that learning into action and yeah. do it for other people and be able to help? So, I mean, I have a real bent towards, I mean, really high conflict parenting disputes and really being able to help people yeah. take that conflict, get educated around it, understand the psychological impact to their children, bring it down off the ceiling and let's move forward in a way that is constructive. Yeah. I love that because I think kids are such the victim of divorces uh -huh. because the when you get into that, like, me versus you and it gets ugly and because there's a lot of animosity and you just forget the kids you forget yeah. what it's doing to the kids and you don't think because my ex-husband had an affair back a few years before we got a divorce and you think that they don't know stuff and you think that and then one of my daughters came to me and said you know is dad you know is see seeing somebody else because she overheard a conversation that we didn't think that she overheard. Right. 
right. you try to protect them and they, they still, and they, and they can pick up the vibes. They, they know when there's tension and, and they're not stupid. So I love that you're, you're really an advocate for the children. And you talked about, uh, I think in your, in the notes you sent me that you were a, a guardian ad litem. My parents did that. They were t retired teachers and they moved to Florida and they were like the advocates for children in the court system. So I, I, it sounds like you, you are serving such a great need. One of my questions is, well, my experience, my personal experience, my kids were adults when we got divorced and oh. not that it doesn't affect adult children. Do you help with adult children too? Oh and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, I think adult children are the most impacted by divorce. Interestingly, because it is a really hard sell for a child to go off you know, to college or whatever and go start their own lives. And then all of a sudden that solid foundation that they thought they were leaving kind of crumbles. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. they start questioning. No family home, where we go oh, for Christmas. They yeah. start questioning everything. And especially if an affair was involved, I mean, you then can see so much in children about how that's impacting their young adult relationships. You know, often there's trust issues. And I mean, I, I spend a lot of time with adult children of divorce and really helping them get into therapy, you know, and do the work they need so that they don't carry their parents' divorce into their future relationships. Yeah. And often I, I see this where they they have one parent's ear or you know one parent has their ear put it that way and they're hearing these two sides to the story and they're going to align with one or the other probably and they're not getting the truth because there's there's always half truths right yeah, <laughs> because exactly. it's one person's version versus the other person's version uh so with my experience and I wished I had known about how to navigate it for adult children because I didn't even think about that uh but we had to, it came to, okay, we got to divide up the furniture. And he was really resistant about navigating that whole discussion. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to get a mediator. And I found a guy to mediate. And it was so funny because whatever I said was, it was, he wouldn't, he wouldn't hear it. He wouldn't listen to it, but the guy would say the same thing. And he listened to the guy. So I think having just a third party, do you find this third party that you are kind of is, is something that people are more amenable to? Oh, I think that's very true. And part of that, though, I mean, because I work currently as a parenting coordinator. So somebody in the middle of a high conflict couple who, you know, in all likelihood has already divorced and they have a parenting plan in place and they just cannot see eye to eye like he says the sky's blue and she says it's red you know it's literally just they cannot see eye to eye but having somebody live in the middle of them allows you know to navigate that where i can get information from one person and it can then come from me in some way and it is taken differently than if it were to come straight from that person i mean obviously the goal of parenting coordination though is to educate them and help them to be able to separate, you know, but there is so much emotional work that needs to be done for somebody to be able to separate, you know, the author of the thing from their feelings and be able to just look at the merits on what the person is asking. And, you know, that takes a certain amount of enlightenment, personal development, you know, and some people aren't willing to go there. And so, they might need a parenting coordinator throughout their entire children's lives to be able to actually make decisions and move forward. Otherwise, they just get in these do loops of, you know, just fighting about everything and children really suffer because decisions aren't getting made and children's lives aren't able to move forward. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm interesting about, interested about your experience because my ex-husband and I are good friends too. And, and now, and you, you would go through that turmoil and it's like, oh, uh, and he's happily married. I'm happily married. So there is uh, sunshine on the other side of clouds. Uh, but what do you think is, is it, how, how does that happen for some and not for others? What do you think is, holds people back from getting to that point? I mean, I do think, you know, it's, it's people's psychological development and or mental health struggles. You know, I think some people truly are not able to um, 
you know, to move on, whether that's accepting responsibility for their part in the thing or being able to understand that even if maybe they don't have to accept responsibility, like maybe, you know, they really were more of the innocent spouse. And obviously it's still, there's always two sides and problems. I don't mean that, but sometimes like infidelity, I mean, the spouse that maybe, you know, did not have the infidelity doesn't have any quote unquote blame for the actual like big event that occurred, but often there's stuff that has gone on, you know, the relationship deteriorated such that infidelity did occur. But I mean, it takes a big person to be able to get beyond that. Do you yes. know what I mean? Not and, hold a grudge. Yeah. Not say you ruined able, my life and uh, yeah. It, yeah. Exactly. And, and hold that victim. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and that I think for me is the thing when I'm working with a client who is just always the victim. I mean, my heart just really goes out to that person because I realize like, unless they're going to make a massive turnaround, they are going to spend their entire lives being a victim of this divorce. And to me, that is a tragedy beyond measure. Like uh -huh. I, I mean, you know, going back a little bit to the issue of, you know, me having to like get back to work and um, support my children. My ex was, I don't know the right word even, but he, he has never financially been able to do what he was supposed to do. I mean, even to date, you know, like it has never occurred. And for, I mean, a solid year, I would be like, you know, where's the child support? Where's this? Where's that? And finally, my current husband was like, you know, why do you think th this is going to be any different? Like what, you know, what are you thinking? And I was like, you know, that is a fine question. <laughs> I, <laughs> I do not know what I am thinking. I'm like, clearly, I keep just being eternally optimistic that he'll do the right thing. And, and Doug was like, yeah, I don't know that that's really the way to go here. <laughs> He was like, I kind of think it's time that we accept what, you know, your ex is doing financially and come up with a new plan. And so it was really just, I mean, as simple as that, but to make me realize, oh, okay, I've got to like earn circles around this clown because like I need to pay for all the things forever. And, and that then completely flipped my mindset instead of being a victim of this financial you know, what could be perceived as super unfair. I was like, well, look at this. This is an opportunity for me. Like I am going to go forth and do. And I mean, I started a law firm, grew a law firm, you know, I mean, from nothing. I literally had just moved to Washington and, you know, knew nobody. I mean, and well, I think when you when you play victim, you carry that negative energy and you huh. switched your energy. And then, of course, good things are going to happen for you. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, it's interesting you say, should say that because I did take a look at what my cause was to that affair. Yeah. And we were able to patch things up. We went to counseling and we patched things up because I knew he was the one that took the action that wasn't the wisest. But right. I was the one in a way that pushed him there because I was a workaholic with my job. I was in the computer all the time. I didn't give him like the attention that he needed. I didn't recognize that he needed that. And he just didn't feel taken care of in that way. And so I think, yeah, recognizing and, and just trying to say, why did those actions happen? And right. there's people involved and... It, it, it happened to both of us. And, and yeah, so that's, that's great advice. I love that. What would you say to somebody who's sitting in a relationship and they're not happy? They're, yeah. they're, they're, and may, maybe they've talked about divorce. My ex-husband, I, oh, we talked about divorce six years, 16 years. And finally we got divorced and signed the papers at 26 years. So there's something right. about six. Um, but we, we, we managed to patch things up like it, along the way. And then finally at, at, after the kids grew up, I think I was finally like, I just need to see what life is like without him and on my own it Yeah, and I think bubbling that, up for many years. I think that is such a thing uh, we women typically, you know, stereotypically we do, we worry so much about the impact of divorce on the children. And so we end up staying in relationships that are absolutely not serving us for years and years in the name of the children. 
and I have to tell you, I mean, in my experience, because clearly that's what I did too. I held on for a long time when I shouldn't have. Um, that wasn't my wisest move. Like I let my children then see this dysfunctional relationship. You know, yes. they would have been better off seeing two parents in separate homes, but functioning better and, yes. you know, being more of their best selves than being together. And I think that I think a lot of us really make a mistake. I have to be honest, me included, you know, not taking that step. It's a scary step though. You know, yeah, especially when divorce, because divorce is prevalent now, but it was not in my world. Oh, Both yeah, of our either. parents had stayed married and, you know, it, it, it just wasn't, divorce was a bad word. Yeah. Yeah. So and fear it's of judgment. Now. Peers were like, what are the neighbors going to say? What are like, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. And I don't think that is as strong now as it was when you and I were coming along in this. But I still think people have fear of I mean, I see it all the time in various groups I'm involved in, where these women will write out these things. And I mean, they are miserable. I mean, miserable. And but they'll say things like, yeah, but I think I could hang on for, you know, five more years. And I'm like, why are you giving five more years of this misery in your life over to this other person in this situation when you could get out? And I mean, obviously, finances are a huge thing that, you know, women struggle with because, I mean, to be fair, I think women still carry the invisible load and the mental load of raising a family in most homes. Again, I know I'm being stereotypical, but I do think the data bears that out. I mean, women are still doing so much of that emotional burden. So they worry about even if they get divorced, then how are they going to do all the things? Because they won't have that person that they're at least giving a little to-do list to, you know, to get some things done. And I think that they end up thinking they're doing the right thing. And it is just, um, I think it is not the right thing. And I mean, it is rare. I mean, rare. Like as I sit here, I can't think of one, but I'm sure there is one who has been like, wow, that divorce was a real mistake. I mean, if anything, people are like, oh my gosh, why didn't I do that sooner? I mean, I find people on the other side of divorce to be way more, I mean, it was a transformational experience yeah. rather than a tragedy, but they yeah. go into it thinking it's a tragedy. Yes. Yes. And they think they're going to hurt the person so much. And I'm like, aren't you hurting him now by <laughs> not being your best self? Like, do you think he's ha happy with you being unhappy? Like, like he can't be in his living his best no. life if you're not living yours. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, no, because I mean, and I think of it in terms of Winnie Pooh, like to me, when you're this miserable person, you're like this Eeyore at home and you literally are just, I mean, ugh, you know, like who wants to be around that energy all the time when you're miserable or overworked and you're and and resentful like that is the thing. I actually have a T-shirt now made. I was on a podcast and I said this and the guy sent me a T-shirt with my quote. I love that. But I said, like, resentment and desire cannot live in the same heart. And so there is almost no way to repair your marriage from that place because you've got to get rid of the resentment and the anger. I mean, because you're never going to get to a place where you're desiring each other and you're desiring to be together and you're, you know, desiring to figure out, like, how can you reach your life vision together I mean, there is none of that when you're right. clouded with resentment. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe that me finally deciding I made the decision and I believe that helped my ex-husband. Oh, yeah. it, it helped him to get out of the bad place he was in because he wasn't happy. Totally. Uh, and, and yeah, it's so funny. You mentioned Eeyore because yesterday on my Facebook, somebody said that they were a Tigger, not an Eeyore. It's the second time I've heard that. And it's so true because there's so many Eeyores living with Tiggers. <laughs> Big time. But they're, they're, they're suppressing their Tiggerism. Completely. But I think, I mean, speaking as a Tigger, I like to think of myself as a Tigger piglet combined because I have that wisdom of piglet every so often. But um, like, I had, pig, I had a piglet doll, so piglet was always my favorite. I think that so many Tiggers are... They tend to be super high energy. You know, they might be that kind of 
visionary type, like ideas are flying out all the time. They're a little zanier, you know, they might not be that person that has like an exact morning routine and all the things. I think they often find an Eeyore because they think the Eeyore must be like, they're more together. They're more adult-like. They're more, you know, things just look all right with that person. They tend to be that. And the Eeyore loves the energy of the Tigger. Because, yes. you know, they're so caught in their like, you know, bubble of just like, I wake up every day at 6 a.m. I take my shower. I eat the same breakfast for 32 years. You know, like. It's like I, the opposites attract kind it of thing. It is. And, mm -hmm. but it. I think unless you acknowledge that and really get in it and understand how those differences can also not only attract, but can truly start weighing each other down in this way. And I do think the Tigger is the one that ends up feeling very oppressed, you know, by the Eeyore type, whereas the Eeyore type often feels very, and just like you said it, uncared for. You know, because they feel like they're not getting the the care and attention they need. And it's, you know, we really have to work through that as couples and really, you know, understand that. Because obviously, when you were saying what you were saying, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, but he should have communicated that better. Like, that's not up to you to figure out. Like, you know, but then there's all those dynamics of who's conflict avoidant, you know, who's not like how open are we with having those tough conversations? I mean, there's so much that goes into a marriage that. Yeah. Yeah. You know. What's your, what's your opinion about women? Uh, you know, when I think about my situation and the women that I, I work with, I think that women are, have a more tendency to be the ones that are more introspective and that they're, they're wanting something more. They're wanting to expand and men are more, I mean, they, they can be like, I, I, I'm just satisfied. I'm just going to live the status quo. Um, and maybe it's because the nurturing side of women and we, we've we raised our kids and they, they've we've helped them grow into adults. And now we're like looking for the next like opportunity to nurture. Uh, and so, you know, what do you tell somebody, you know, that if they're feeling like they're wanting to expand and grow is being held back by their partner. Is there, is, are there like talking points that you share with people? Because not many people who start to realize I'm not really happy and, and they don't know what the next step to be. It's not like, I'm not happy. I'm getting a divorce tomorrow. It's like, I'm not happy. How do I start that conversation? How do I navigate him to want to expand himself or to expand well, together or to allow me to expand. Cause I think some guys just get scared. Oh, she's going to change. And then she's going to want me to change or she's going to leave me or, you know, so I think there's fear that men have. A hundred percent. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head and I think people who start that journey of, you know, self-improvement and really trying to dig in and be introspective and kind of really become their next best self in their next act of life, unless their partner is willing to either genuinely come along and like participate in some of it, because they will get lost in the shuffle of just watching their partner. They're not even going to be speaking the same vocabulary anymore. Do you know what I mean? Like, if a woman is really doing the work and I mean, you know, she's reading and going to courses maybe and really expanding her, her worldview in the big world, but also her worldview for herself, like what impact can she make? What can she, what is her genius in the world that she has been really putting on hold? And I'm not saying raising children isn't an amazing opportunity. I mean, I love, love raising my family. But I, I wasn't always in my zone of genius, you know, trying to navigate homework or whatever I was navigating, you know, and um, but having a partner that will come with you on this journey. And if they won't come with you on this journey, I think people have to be very upfront and realize by a partner choosing not to come on the journey it is very likely you're going to end up growing apart and like you, the person won't want to stay. Like if it's the woman doing this, you know, work and introspection, I mean, she's going to outgrow this person. I mean, yeah. genuinely. Yeah. And 
you know, or she's I not going to live ever fulfilled. Oh, you know, she's going to exactly. die with regrets that she didn't do what she thought right. she should do. She was too scared. Yeah. What or came up for me? Guilty. Yeah. 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 Feeling guilty that, yeah, I can't do because, because, you know, women want to make, I think ultimately make the people they love happy and, and it's kind of impossible to make somebody who doesn't want to change happy. But it's funny because I think about my husband now and my husband, it, like, like you, you knew him from the past. He, he was an old boyfriend. So we have a history uh, and he's not somebody who like me is like, you know, gobbling up every bit of personal development and like so excited about, oh, the new things I can do. Right. Uh, but I will say he is so supportive of my growth. Oh, and so yeah. I would pay attention to that if you're somebody who has a husband who's not interested in personal growth, as long as he is supportive of your development and your personal growth. And he, he like, he's, he said, he said to me, I just want you to be happy. And that is like, means the world to me. Oh, he doesn't have to be in, in the, you know, in, 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 in the full out, you know, place with me as in terms of let's grow together. Let's go to Tony Robbins. He would never go to Tony Robbins. Uh, but I think, and then he'll cut little things out that he sees in the newspaper that I are like that. Maybe little happy quotes and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's but, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, it's like, I, I know he's, he's there for me. I know he's, totally. he's not, he's not totally on board with this for him, but he knows it's this for me and it makes me happy. So yeah. I would say to anybody who thinks their partner isn't there, ask them, do you want me to be happy? Are you okay with me exploring more in this world? Right. Uh, and see what their answer is, see what their response is. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I would say my husband is exactly like that. I mean, he'll do some things with me and he'll go to things. He understands being the spouse of an entrepreneur, somebody running a multiple seven figure business. It's busy, you know, in that he knows that he, the more he understands and like meets with other law firm owners, he can kind of understand where I'm coming from and, you know, the stress I might be under. And that has been very powerful, but he, like your husband, he would not go to a Tony Robbins event. No, but he is, I mean, will absolutely carry my bags into the hotel. If I want to go to a Tony Robbins event, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and he'll come with me for the most part, you know, to all the things just cause you know, he be at the hotel doing his work and, let me go do my thing. But I think that that it just, it means everything to the relationship when you feel fully supported and you can fully support them in their endeavors, because there is a feeling of what, at least from my perspective, wanting to do more for somebody who is so supportive of you. I cannot like, I mean, I cannot be more supportively feeling towards my husband. Like, I'm like, oh, well, what do you want to do? And how, you know, you want a boat? Let's get a boat. Like, you want this? Like, do you know what I mean? Like trying, and there is no resentment, you know, because nobody is holding the other one back. Yeah. 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 And I, I often think, you know, men and women are wired so differently. And so often we think they should think like us. <laughs> <laughs> they never will. Sometimes I think it would be so much easier to be in a gay relationship with another woman because then like she would want to do the things I want to do and she would want to expand and she would want to do the things. Uh, so it's kind of like understanding where he is, putting myself in his shoes. But um, I would encourage any listener who is going through this and feels like they're they're wanting to these things and and they feel a little stifled have you had that conversation? Have you ha just asked, like, are you okay with this? And do you want me to be happy? That is an answer you deserve to have, right? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. And we're afraid of these conversations sometimes, I think. Like we're, oh. we think we know the answer and, and, it, and it, don't you want to know the answer? Because if the answer is you're, you're full of crap and no, I, I'm like, you know, you're, I, I just want to sit here and be miserable and I want you to be miserable with me. Well, that's a good, that's a good thing to know. <laughs> and I want you to cook all my dinners timely because, 
you know, that's what I'm used to. Yeah, you definitely want to know that. But I mean, that's a whole nother podcast. If we want to talk about how people think they know the answers to things. I mean, that voice in our head, I mean, we like to think it somehow tells the truth. But I mean, that voice in our head is nonsense so yeah. much of the time. And being able to actually question that voice and ask, like, is this actually true? Like, do I have some empirical evidence to tell me this is true or is this just some random chatter? I mean, I call my voice Eloise and I mean, Eloise talks smack and I have to like, you know, rein her in every so often. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, Eloise, but yeah. none of that yeah. is real. Yeah. And she probably thinks she knows the answer to what your husband would say, right? Of, of it's course. like, it's like, why even ask him? I know the answer. And we always, yeah. it's never what we think it's, it's yeah. yeah. And so we avoid the, the conversations, but yeah. So maybe we, I should have you back. We should go a little <laughs> deeper, but it's been great. I love talking to you. I like to ask people at the end of my conversations, because it's all about living your spark second half. And you feel like, like you have this expertise you've developed and you're really helping people. And, and I didn't even think when I asked you to be on here, you know, of course I thought you're helping people navigate this difficult time in their lives, but I never thought about the children and even adult children. That was a shock to me that you are really making an impact in the world. That's positive because it's, it's, it's a tough time for people. Uh, it's so, such a tough time. Yeah. And so how do you, and it's funny because before I hit record, I asked her how old she was and she was like, I don't know. And I had to tell her how old she was. Uh, <laughs> and I'm I love so that. I that. how old you are because we focus so much on that. But yeah, so now that you're like 55 and you know you're 55 <laughs> and, and I'm I sorry that you wanted to be younger and you found out you're 55, but like, so what do you see like after this point, like going forward, what do you see? Where do you see your life going? Where do you see you helping more and making an impact? Sure. I think for me, the two areas that I feel most strongly about are, and we haven't even talked about either of them, actually. One is this fair play thing. And I don't know if you've read the book Fair Play by Eve Rodsky or seen the documentary or there's a card game. It is all about bringing a system into homes and having the conversations around what are all the tasks you have to do to raise a family. Oh, it is. Oh my gosh. I want to watch it and then ha we'll have another it's, conversation. It's game changing. Game yeah. changing. And I mean, my goal would be to stop people from needing me for divorce. I would love it if more couples could have these conversations, share equitably the work in the home of the mental load. I mean, Eve's entire protocol is all based on owning your card from beginning to end. So let's say you own extracurriculars. That means you're doing the conceptualizing, the planning and the executing of that. So you're not having all these random like, you're asking your spouse all the time, can you do this one thing while you're project managing in your head, the whole thing, it allows you to split up. So I highly recommend looking into fair play. Like it is game changing. Every yeah, Cause you can turn into a nag, you know, uh, because exactly. well, you're still trying to control it. it. Yeah. They call it rats. It's like random assigned tasks. And it's literally, it's this horrible system. Yes. So fair play. So I, I'm a fair play facilitator. I love like talking about fair play and bringing it to people. And it's a wonderful tool in divorced families as well. So they can co-parent better. Sounds like and it would be good for siblings. Oh, it's amazing for, you just have no idea. It's amazing for roommates too. You have young yes. kids in college and they don't know like how to talk about all the stuff that needs to get done mm -hmm. in a household. I mean, it's just amazing. And then secondarily, the thing that I am so passionate about is law firm culture and having a law firm that has a positive culture where people are not becoming burned out, stressed, miserable. Um, the law is a really horrendous profession for treating its people horribly. And it is to me this great travesty because I think being a lawyer is one of the greatest privileges in a democracy. And I think it is an honor to work with people and families at some of their worst times, but it is hard work and you get a lot of vicarious trauma. And so you need good balance and I call it life work integration. And we have developed a law firm that allows people to choose their own hours. Like we are 
all remote. We are flexible. Oh, that's and, great. I mean, one day we are probably going to move that model beyond just the Washington area. But also, even more importantly to me, we need to get it into law school. We need to change law firm culture. I mean, from the top down and the bottom up. I mean, it I is, love that. It is a shame to me that lawyers are committing suicide at the rates they do. They have drug and alcohol problems at absolutely horrendous rates. Yeah. And I mean, I hire people who literally can tell me so many PTSD type stories of working in past firms. And I'm like, how is that possible that you were treated like this, yeah. you know, by somebody with a, a law degree? <laughs> like yeah. what? Yeah. That's my brother-in-law is a lawyer. He has his own firm. And the thing that I see with him, which makes me sad, is he does he he can't do anything virtually. So I love oh. that you're virtual. So oh, yeah. so if I was in Virginia going through a divorce, I could Zoom call with you, and I could hire you. You're you you can do. I mean, you, I, you you can only work in Washington State, though, right? Correct. Well, I can work in Minnesota and Louisiana too. Oh, okay, so but, virtual. Um, you could do virtually, I guess. I for them. could. Yeah, we haven't opened offices, you know, or gotten a presence in those states yet. But no, I mean, people can hire me and they do hire me often in a coaching role, you know, yes. from other states. Like I can work with parents on you like know, a parenting how, plan. Correct. And I'm, I couldn't sign it and I couldn't, you know, present it in the court. They would need to have their state lawyer do that. But I mean, I can coach people and work with people on, you know, how can we develop a parenting plan that is developmentally appropriate for your children, reasonably appropriate, you know, for the parents based on their conflict level, their work, the whole bit. But um, I mean, really being able to help people navigate divorce so that they are putting their kids front and center rather than just caught in the middle of this big nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. It's been such a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to look up that fair play and Absolutely. I'll put a link to the, whatever I find about it. Yeah, uh, and maybe we can have another conversation. It's gone yeah. really fast. I mean, or we've like 45 minutes. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you. We finally got the tech worked out. She's like, well, uh, the video worked fine. Her lips weren't moving with her, 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 her audio. So it all worked out. Yeah. So thank you so much, Elise. And how, where can people get in touch with you, your website? My website, Elise Bowie Family Law. And then they can just email me, you know, from there. And, um, and obviously, you know, all over social media, you know, yeah. you can yeah. find us on all the things. And, all right. Um, yeah. yeah, we'll, and we'll link up to those things in the show notes. So Okay, thanks, thanks Lori. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the Living Your Spark second half podcast. If you'd like to watch my guest interviews, you can find the video version of this podcast on my Not Your Average Grandma YouTube channel. Also, you can check out what I have going on at the moment by going to my website at notyouraveragegrandma.com or find me on Instagram or Facebook at Not Your Average Grandma. If you like this episode, please mention it to a friend and don't forget to leave a review so I know the topics you like best and can bring you more of that content in upcoming episodes. Last but not least, remember to always listen to that inner voice that will never steer you wrong and make living from the most sparked place possible your biggest priority. When we do that, we make the world a better place.